I have with me today John Spencer. He's chair of Urban Warfare Studies at Modern Warfare Institute. But John, you know, you have quite a m larger background than that. So I'd love to give the audience a little bit of background in yourself, if you may. And uh, yeah, just tell tell us a little bit about your your background, what your experience is in terms of warfare. Sure. So I, you know, John Spencer, uh, I spent 25 years in the U.S. Army as a an infantry soldier and officer with two combat deployments to Iraq, both in the 2003 invasion and later at the height of the sectarian violence in 2008, 2009. I was teaching strategy and war studies at West Point as my last job in the army, where I helped create the research center that I work for now called the Modern War Institute. And when I retired in 2018, I became a research professor where I traveled the world studying uh, wars in places like Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, I've been to Israel many times. I'm currently in Ukraine um, studying the wars and bringing that information back to other militaries or our own military to be taught or to inform the way that the future is approaching. I have a few books out, one called Understanding Urban Warfare, uh, based on the fact that I've been studying academically uh, for over a decade, solely fighting in cities or, or what we call urban warfare. Uh, and that's where I'm at now. Well, I have to ask, what made you, you know, what? why do you think it's so important to study war in the first place? I mean, because unfortunately, and it wasn't Plato, it was actually another guy, but only the dead have seen the end of war. So in order to prevent things or to lessen the cost of war, it's better to understand what triggers it, how militaries pursue their political objectives, what are the bounds to it, which I'm sure. I'm sure we'll talk about uh, as war, you know, predates as as much dates civilizations as it does today. War is not going away, but we have as a as a you know human race tried to put bounds on the savagery of war, so that there are limitations to what can be done in pursuit of political objectives. Which again, it, the more people understand it, the more people uh, can comprehend it. It actually should lead to a better understanding and. and hopefully prevention and the pursuit of goals without unconstrained use of force. What would you say is the most misunderstood thing by, by the general population about war in general? I mean, I think some of the, the, the biggest misunderstandings is that civilians are the, the usually historically, even in the last 20 years, the the deaths of war uh, over 90 percent of the last 20 years wars which are predominantly in populated urban areas for many reasons uh, but the fact that, that it is the civilians uh and and that we after world war ii many of the laws of war were strengthened uh and prohibitations on what you can do what kind of tools you can use what kind of weapons you can use all to lessen the cost of wars because world war ii was of course horrific um, on not just the million person armies that were fielded to fight, but the civilian populations, entire cities destroyed, entire, you know, of course, the, the atrocities of the, of the Holocaust. So there are a lot of things that were put in place, especially after the nuclear age, right? So there are things that change war as we know it. Um, and the threats of, so strategy that we teach is strategy is the pursuit of political objectives through the use of force or the threat of use of force. So dating back to like, you know, Athens and, and Spartans and Peloponnesian wars, but there are things that change the way war is run and nuclear war is one of those. So I think those are the two big, big misunderstandings. One is that civilians are the costs of war, unfortunately, innocent non-combatant civilians who are stuck in the middle of war. Uh, for whatever reason. And, but there are theories that we've developed, like the theory of just war, which is under the current rules in which the world has agreed upon, there, there are just or reasons that we all say, yes, that is a reason to start a war. And then there is just execution of war, which is even if you're, it's, it's your right, it is the right thing to do to, under just war to start a war. But then you still have to execute it in accordance with uh, all the rules of following just execution of the war. Before I got all flustered, we were talking about how, um, you know, there's 
the civilian casualties is something that you brought up as something that most yeah. people don't understand by war. And also, you know, I imagine that, you know, throughout the history, and you were touching a little bit on that, uh, you know, combat was a little bit different, right? It was more direct. And now we are at a place where we have weapons, high precision weapons, some not so high precision weapons, but they can do a lot more damage. So imagine some of the rules of war that have changed had to sort of encapsulate that. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, nuclear weapons changed everything in strategy and war in general. In most people view war and everybody talks about it under the nuclear threshold, right? Or they jump to conclusions that certain types of war will lead to what we call global nuclear war. So basically mutually assured destruction, which are all, these are all parts of different aspects of teaching theories of this. But you know, even war developments. So some people believe, and there's a bunch of fallacies about war, right? That it can be done surgically. It can be done by you know these special forces and, and there are other tools and why everybody has to go so destructive. But again, that's a misunderstanding of combat versus war versus um, different environments, different uh, situations with different nation state actors. But the age of the idea of war being two militaries clashing in the open terrain of like the folded gap or the rolling hills of Europe are gone because it, that's not that's not reality. Um, there are principles of war. There are theories of war. There are kind of reason of like one military wants to strike the other military as far away as possible. So it doesn't sacrifice his blood and treasure. So that's why you develop longer ranging missiles, longer ranging, more explosive power. So you can achieve your military goal long before you get close to the enemy. So that those developments have happened. But again, like Ukraine, like other wars have taught us is that War is a contest of wills. It's still political. Uh, and by will, information can affect entire strategies of war. Uh, there's so much to it, right? And this is why I have, I love my job. I actually do. I love understanding where we've come and where we're going and what are the realms of possible or giving people the reality of what, what war looks like. Um, even when it's following every rule that we've tried to create and agree upon, uh, like what weapons can and can't be wooed. Well, and one of the biggest examples is bombings, right? So before, until the end of the World War II, bombing of civilian populations to influence an enemy to do something was acceptable, right? This was the bombing of Tokyo, the bombing of Dresden, um, the German bombing of London. It was not a violation of war to do that because there was a, an ideal strategic bombing theory that you could bomb a population into convincing its government to stop fighting. That was banned. That doesn't happen anymore. Despite what people think and what reality is, uh, it is now mutually agreed upon, even though, although we can talk about it again, where it's happening for real and nobody's doing anything about it, but it is unacceptable to target civilians to include in bombing campaigns for the pursuit of a military goal, like to cause suffering in the population. Like these are the rules of war that um, have been strengthened. And, and if we don't uphold them, as in we as a society, we as a world, then it leads to more suffering. So like, um, and hopefully we get to talk about it, what Russia has done in Ukraine is a violation of all of these internationally uh, accepted rules of when nations can go to war, what can, is acceptable in the use of war, what you can target, what you can do. And Russia has violated almost every one. Well, since you brought us, it up. Yeah. Well, since you brought it up, what we can start there, actually, I guess, um, you know, you I've heard you mention that what what is happening in Ukraine are war crimes. Yes. So would love to sort of have a brief outline of what makes them war crimes. Sure. Uh, so one, the the invasion of Ukraine was a, a an illegal act in accordance with the U.N. Charter of invading a sovereign nation for not for self-defense for basically pursuit of a political goal which was to overthrow the ukrainian government there but in the execution of the war the war crimes have included the purposely targeting of civilian civilians period uh, the bombing of like uh, there's so many examples but like the bombing of the mariupol which was 
was uh, indiscriminately bombed and civilians, like an entire theater full of civilians, women and children with the words children written around it was bombed in like unknown number, but over 300 to 600 civilians targeted on purpose, no military objective. Um, the mutilation of POWs, the kidnapping of babies. So right now, there's only one body that we all agree upon. Even if you're a signature of the International Criminal Court, there's only one body who can investigate a war crime and say, yes, war crime by international standards. Like they have the, the investigative teams, they have the lawyers. They are the body. Well, and, and this is why when you talk about the current context is you'll see political leaders or even humanitarian groups saying might be a war crime because it has to be investigated. The president of Russia has an active arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court for the kidnapping of babies in Ukraine, over 100,000, and taking them into Russia and giving them to Russian parents. And those children will never know that they were Ukrainian. They will be raised as like they, they, they were born to those people. There is an active warrant for him and other members of the Russian government. Like it's very legitimate. hard to put a, um, you know, a legitimate war target justification on, on something like that. That is such a blatant example. Um, you know, in the beginning of the war, I, I, you know, the very first day I watched the city that I was born in, uh, Dnieper, uh, basically be uh, just civilian buildings. And, and later on, you know, Russians would say, well, this is you know, they were military targets. We were, they, they were keeping things there, but on the first day of war, you couldn't, there's just no way that that could even possibly be true. And they were civilian buildings. Um, you know, you watch, there was a lot of footage of just elderly people in their cars being shot in the middle of nowhere. Um, I know lots of people have lost their loved ones. So but these things get sort of concealed and justified and, and, um, and there is this kind of narrative that keeps going through that that dismisses these these crimes. Right. Do you think that happens because of, you know, just just people not wanting to support certain th regimes and and um, the propaganda? And I'd love to kind of get a sense of like how much do you think propaganda, which we're seeing so much of today, affects actually contributes to the impact on war. Oh, 100%. I mean, all wars is political. Uh, all war is a context. So there's a what we call this trinity that we try to, a guy invented a long time ago to help people understand that when, when a war happens, it's just not military on military. Of course, it's, it's the military. It's the government or the politicians that sent the military to do it. And then the populations which support the government and which, so it's called a trinity uh, in one sense of it's all three actors. And all three actors are influenced their will to continue. So the soldier's will is influenced with motivation to fight, all these reasons why it's fighting. Politicians are influenced by will of what the national interest is and to pursue it, to make the hard decisions. And populations are influenced both locally and internationally to support the war's con continuation. And then the pressure, either support through aid, alliance, resistance, uh, active participants, things like that. So yes, information war has always been a part of war, but now because of technology, and then I wrote a book, another book called Connected Soldiers about this, is that we all can get a we all get firsthand views into wars without understanding them, and it greatly influences our wars. And I think like Bucha is an example, right? Bucha, where entire massive amounts of the civilian population had their hands tied behind their backs and they were shot close range in the back of the head. And still people deny that the war crimes or massacres have happened when everybody was let in. All, every, anybody who wanted, investigative journalists, everybody to document it. But this is how slow it is too on that. But absolutely, these influence the war. And this is where misinformation comes in. Both state-backed mis, mis, misinformation, which Russia calls active measures, where you take a kernel of truth and then you surround it in lies and expand it to a massive influence campaign so where some you know usually there's a, a very small kernel of truth and then you expand it to where you now you have and then you have influencers on like the, the megaphones of people where they get their information right it's not just news agencies anymore they get their information from bad actors or you know conspiracy theorists or things like that but that war is a contest of will 
the information dom domain is where people are influenced on will and it can become a greater impact to a million people 40 million people like in ukraine than the fighting itself although war is still killing and and, and destruction well, and also um, it can influence policy. So whether a country supports uh, another country in that in that military action, whether they give them funding, weapons. So that is in that way, it's such a crucial, critical uh, battlefield. And of course, we're seeing that. And in terms of that denial of sort of the atrocities, I think we're obviously seeing quite a parallel in um, with Israel Palestine situation or Gaza rather, uh, where you know October seventh, um, it went from you know this was a, a horrible atrocity that the Hamas terrorists had basically you know uh, themselves. Uh, recorded and showed to the world because they were so proud of their own crimes to suddenly being, oh, they were only targeting, they were really targeting military um, um, targets. And uh, and Israel, uh, now it's morphed into Israel had shot most of the uh, civilians themselves. And of course, they must have, uh, I guess they raped themselves and tortured, which uh, crimes that they also deny, even though those are so document, well documented, confirmed by multiple entities, eyewitnesses, people have lost their loved ones. But how do you explain that kind of morphing of narratives where there is, you know, so much documentation, including by the perpetrators themselves, which is sort of unique to this level of denialism and skepticism. And, you know, and I imagine some of it comes also from distrust of um, institutions, media institutions, but I don't think that accounts for all of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have the right words for it, but we're actually seeing an evolution in the character of warfare where this battle of ideals, which is normal but has the potential where a single thing can be taken and can influence millions of people, right? This is the dangerous part of it. I call it dangerous where something like this in October 7th, where it isn't, um, there is always conspiracy theories, right? It's, it's a, it's a thing, right? Uh, people just go down these dark holes and, and, and believe that everybody else is wrong. And, and uh, these select few people are right. But when Hamas uploads their own videos for shock value, I it, it's it's crazy that now Hamas has an army of people that are trying to discount what Hamas wanted, which was the shock of their viciousness. I mean, they would which is you know nice's tactic, but they would take the, the victim's phone, Facebook live their execution and the mutilation uh, and, and just and then people take like, again, a kernel of truth, like the aspect of the 40 beheaded babies. And say that nobody ever provided 40. So no massacre happened at all. Like nobody was killed, basically. Since since you can't show me 40 beheaded babies and, and you can't show me one beheaded baby, then everything's a lie. And, and everything didn't happen, even though Hamas wants people to know what happened because it it wants the shock value of the atrocities to 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 cause this. I mean, it, it's so maddening and crazy that not just the people who do it, like 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 the scum of the earth. Jackson Hinkle, um, it, it is the people believe it that they're they we have lost so much in some societies about critical thinking and doing your own investigation. Like go watch Hamas's videos; they uploaded for you um, if you can stomach them and make your own conclusion rather than going to some clown who's who makes lying a profession for mo for money. You have to pay to hear his lies. And believe that that's the truth. Everybody else is wrong. Even Hamas. The, the, they're not. I know why. Because I listened to this guy. It's well, and there's this. It feels like there's a disproportionate social media warfare, let's say, where one side one will use any tactic to sort of cloud things, uh, whether it's taking, you know, videos from other contexts and putting their own headlines on it um, or um completely fabricating quotes and also using shocking imagery, you know, perhaps of uh, sometimes real, sometimes not real uh, casualties uh, from in terms of context um, to sort of invoke emotion. Whereas, for example, with the dead babies, which 
actually, you know, from my research, there was forensic international team of forensic experts who uh, I think there was 200 of them from all over the world who did look at the evidence and um, and, uh, and and the story, by the way, for anybody listening who's not aware, is that it wasn't that there were 40 beheaded babies, but some babies were beheaded. And <laughs> like that makes all the difference. Right, um, right. But that is sort of like people want to see images of beheaded babies. And of course, that is pretty, uh, you know, not something that I imagine any parent would want shared or or even of adult people. You know, it's, it's like there is almost forced to share some of the atrocities. And I know originally Israel um, directive was not to share uh, these gory images because it, it actually encourages uh, terror acts because right. it, it sort of incites people. So it's, it, it's like having your hands kind of behind your back in a way when you're yep. fighting this uh, information war. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And we can talk about, too, the, even the IDF and the execution of their operation having to have um, be put on a put on a level that no military in the world has ever been put on in the execution of war um, and following all the rules. And then being from the very first action being saying, you know, even by um, humanitarian organizations that have some credibility, all war crimes. Mm -hmm. and, and they're misinforming and then there's the kind of the problem with you know the 30 second headline or whatever that's taken out of context um it's all very dangerous where people aren't trusting even like you said where like all the journalists that were shown the footage and, and could, many of them threw up from seeing the footage but all oh, that's a lie no because of that that headline it, nothing happened and the fratricide the same thing like where i'm sure it happened i'm sure that there were people caught in the chaos of battle, it happened, and, sure. and there was somebody was caught in the crossfire when Israel was responding to this vicious massacre. But because a single person might have been caught in the crossfire, Israel massacred all of its own people. It's it's insanity, but it is reality. Well, it's like you say, it's that grain of truth, um, which I, I will call that disinformation when it's intentional, misinformation when it's unintended. But I think this comes down to this undermining that has been going on on media institutions, which, by the way, I criticize media institutions a lot. I think they're highly problematic in how they carry out. So part of it is their responsibility, too. But um, there was almost this some of the undermining has been because this loss of trust that's somewhat justified. And some of it, I think, was sowing the seeds of dissent, which I would say Russia was a big player in because I know that they pay people to specifically influencers and people like that uh, to to sort of align and spread their narratives. And, and even in the messaging that they're putting forward, they are absolutely trying to undermine trust in these uh, particularly media institutions, but all institutions in general. So I think when we arrive at this moment, Part of it is because of that. And then cer certainly people have taken to trusting sort of influencers who should have even less trust than media institutions that at least have some standard of journalism. And um, and that's where they're putting their faith. But there's also these narratives like, uh, you know, your article touched on uh, more than touched on uh, your article for CNN about whether Israel is committing war crimes, because all we're hearing is Israel is a criminal, a terrorist uh, state. It's it's committing war crimes, genocide, all these kind of hot button words that seem to be echoed in pretty much unison by certain groups of people. They're all using the same language, which I find uh, quite interesting and always the same images, the same excerpts, but also, and I'll steel men this a little bit so that you can address it. Um, some of the criticism that has a little bit more, um, a little bit more merit to it is, for example, some people believe that instead of using, say, strikes, uh, that will cause more civilian deaths. You know, they should have been on the ground and be more precise. And that would mean, of course, more casualties to Israeli soldiers, but less perhaps civilian deaths on the Palestinian side, children, etc. So what, what's your response to this? I mean, it's, it, it's just uh, uninformed people on how, how war works. The fact that if you thought that uh, not well, basically not responding to Hamas's rockets. So it wasn't just October 7th Hamas attack. Um, Hamas fired 2,000 rockets at Israeli citizens, not military targets, 
on day one and have since fired 9,000 rockets. So to think that, okay, you could have done this differently. One, there's, I haven't, I haven't seen anybody come up with an alternative other than, okay, don't respond with an air, air campaign, unlike every battle I've ever studied in the history of war, um, to soften the enemy's positions before you enter because they're densely populated areas. Just go ahead and go go closer and face the enemy's defenses at close range. And again, to believe that that would cause less destruction, it's just, a, it's just somebody who's not informed because when a force gets close like that, then they use fires like artillery, mortars, and airstrikes to support the force moving closer uh, to, like I said before, all enemies, all militaries want to strike their enemy as far away as they can to include in an air campaign to, to basically soften the enemy. Uh, this gets to like in the article about, you know, there are main principles of war, right? You can't, you can't shoot at civilians, period. You can't attack a, a civilian population or into a civilian structure unless it's a military target, right? That's one of the principles of war. Military necessity, there's a military reason like stopping rockets from coming at you or taking out an enemy combatant in, in, in pursuit of your military objective. And then there is you know, proportionality that what you use, the force you use, whether it's a rocket or a, a, a military unit, is proportional to the to the concrete military objective you're about to achieve, like stopping a rocket from coming at you or destroying a, an organization who just committed a, a vile act on civilian populations through the use of military force. And then what's the value of that? It becomes it doesn't become great. It just becomes not as simple as people want. And the, well, and the proportionality. Yeah, of course. It's a big one that people, of course, get stuck on. It was a big uh, aspect of your article, which everyone yes. should read. Um, but, you know, there is this sense of, oh, well, look, they killed this many people in uh -huh. Israel, and uh, now you're killing so many more. Um, this is an unproportional response. To which, you know, another argument would be, well, they also raped, burned, and killed and tortured people. Is the proportional response to go do all of that? No, um, it, I would say yeah. no. But right, this is this is again so many people uninformed. To include in mass media, like people I I really trust and and, and I respect, who have no clue what they're talking about by using that term. Right, you can use the term. Is it equal? Is it? But once you start using the term proportional, people associate that with the law of war proportionality, which has nothing to do with the number of civilians killed before the war was what triggered the war versus the response. There's no war in history where that has been in any type of calculation. It, it's not the way a war works. There is the reason the war was started, the attack. So it, Israel gets to respond in self-defense from being attacked, which they declared war on Hamas with the military objective to destroy Hamas military capability ever to do it again. The numbers of civilian casualties have nothing to do with October 7th and the 1400 and growing number of individuals that were massacred that were not military targets, although a very small portion of that was a legitimate military target. If, if you do the laws of war, Israel military forces, even though, but mutilation and, and all of this stuff is not. Had proportionality, when people say that statement, they just show their ignorance that October 7th number of civilian casualties proportional to whatever the numbers. I, and every civilian death is a travesty and not um, should be avoided. But the number has nothing to do with proportionality. Proportionality is a, a law of war assessment based on the military objective that you're trying to achieve. Was the action proportional to the destruction of Hamas from attacking Israel's survival? Again, it has nothing to do... It, that's when that one's so frustrating, not just as a, a scholar of war, but just from a, as a rational person, like stop using that as the argument to say that Israel is committing some type of violation of war. It's not, especially in that aspect. There is no comparison to that. Yes, there are additional protocols in law of war about the cautions you must take to protect civilians because of after World War II, like we said. No indiscriminate bombing, no targeting of civilians to try to get the enemy to do what you want. That's a different conversation than it's not proportional. Well, and people um, like to make the argument that uh, this is collective punishment of some sort, um, which I'll bring up this particular argument because it's worth exploring. Um, so Israel did um, cut off water supply, food, 
uh, energy, right? Electricity. Um, well, let's, be, let's use the right words. Israel stops sending Israel's water, electricity, and food into Gaza. Would they have had another option, I guess, is the question. What, were they reliant on Israel because they had no other choice? Or were they reliant on it because they've chosen to rely on it? Exactly. Um, I, don't, I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but as an assessment of is it legal to cut off supplies to a civilian population, there are protocols, especially after the siege of Sarajevo, that were strengthened to say that you can't do that if your intention is to to make the civilian population suffer because of what their political government or a terrorist organization did. You can't definitively say that's what Israel is doing. Israel cut off their supplies, and yes, you're right. Uh, Hamas could have spent the billions of dollars just over the last 10 years that were provided to Hamas as a political organization of Gaza, or you can just say the Palestinian people of Gaza, to improve infrastructure, to include not cutting up the water pipes um, to make rockets, to include uh, over-draining the aquifers in Gaza, which made them basically unusable. Uh, absolutely, there is a conversation. And collective punishment actually is in the laws of war, and you can't do it, right? Like we said. Uh, but again, people take a kernel of truth. When Israel said, I, I'm cutting this off, I'm stopping the uh, like the 80% of Israel water provided to, out of good faith, to help the Palestinian people, I, like I have no ownership to do that um, until you give the hostages up. How many days, people don't understand how many days that actually happened, how many days that the Rafa gate was closed and humanitarian aid couldn't get in. But because there's a kernel of truth to them cutting off Israel supplied things, to, it wasn't a blockade, it wasn't cutting off. One, it's not physically possible to do that. Uh, you have to, even in Sarajevo, which is the longest siege in modern history, it wasn't cut off. There was a freedom tunnel that stuff got in and out of. It, but again, it is unlawful as a, a military strategy to do that. But again, that's not what Israel did. But because of the the wording and the the inferences and and the the unaware, you're not not even listening to what the IDF did. People say, "Oh, yeah, of course you can say they did a war crime. They cut off even when it was happening." The scholar said, "Could be considered a war crime." might be if if done for a duration right if if you could tie the link to stopping their supplies going into gaza to uh one what are the available resources already in gaza since we know hamas has vast supplies of fuel water food in their tunnels for hamas uh to include even protection of civilians you'd have to show that that was part of the calculation intention right the investigation will be about what was the intention of Israel when they stopped this for that certain amount of time. And then what was the cost of that intention? Uh, it isn't like, bam, war crime. Uh, it is so crazy how that kernel of act can then be saying, you know, oh, you know, were this collective punishment of the entire Palestinian people, uh, despite everything that's been done to get the civilians out of harm's way and to turn the water back on in the location in which Israel supplies water to where Israel asked the civilian population to go to where how many trucks nobody cares now how many trucks of humanitarian aid have actually come through the southern Gaza nobody cares about that number it's not enough right so it's collective punishment it's, mm -hmm. it's insane it's it's not even I'm not I'm not I'm I am of course pro-israel I'm pro uh, just war just execution but I'm actually pro facts. Yeah. Well, the military, from a military perspective, did it have any um, positive effect from, from your point of view? No, uh, very limited, right? So this is the ideal. It was, um, you know, again, war is politics. You could say it, it for the time, and, and I'm sure this is what goes into the calculation of what Israel did next, that it stopped doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it it, it started f providing water, but nobody cares then. Like it already happened, right? So nobody cares that the IDF turned the water back on to Southern it Gaza and that it's done all this work to get supplies in all of this stuff. Now, nobody cares because that one thing happened, that kernel of truth. And then they expand it to be a lie about it going on for a long duration and the impact and all this stuff. You know, yeah, we'll, we'll be again, more investigation clearly that that was an unwise decision, but this is, you know, again, nobody can tell Israel what to do. They can, people can though, 
hold Israel accountable to the international humanitarian law. And that's being done. Yeah. And, and quite a bit, but uh, yeah. And in my, the intel that I have on this particular um, situation was that the intention was indeed to um, pressure Hamas to free hostages. That was the absolute intent of, of the government. But um you know, I agree. I don't think that was an effective one because I just don't think Hamas cares enough about their people. So it's result, uh, you know, uh, it, it sort of was not, I think, a wise decision. It was a miscalculation in, in my view. Not that I'm I'm not an war expert, but but right. as, as they've recognized themselves. Right. Because they've they've changed course, which does sort of illustrate that it wasn't about just punishing people. Uh, it was about a, a particular attempt at a war tactic. Um, it, it's something, the, the other thing that people say is like, okay, Israel is, uh, when people try to get out, uh, they tell them to go certain places and then they get bombed as they're heading in that direction. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think, again, that's, that's a, a taking the kernel of truth. The fact that there have been strikes in southern Israel, uh, IDF never said that they would not there would be complete areas of Gaza that, that uh, no strike would happen, is that they would limit the main combat area to the north, that they haven't targeted civilians, right? If, if somebody can prove Israel targeted civilians that were evacuating, then that is a straight war crime. And I would consider strongly condemn it. Yeah. But one of the challenges of that is that they said, I'll, I'll still keep striking Hamas that's in southern Israel, period. Uh, but the one of the problems is that Hamas doesn't wear a uniform. And it purposely does what's called lawfare, where it it uses ambulances, hospitals, uh, civilian populations to intermix and hide themselves. So in order to say that Israel targeted civilians, you would need facts. You would need evidence. And just the fact that you have civilian casualties does not mean Israel targeted civilians. You have to know what the military target was in that strike. And Israel has made mistakes in the past. All militaries have. The U.S. military has struck clear civilian targets. Um and, and has come up and, and then in self-evaluation and just execution of war said, yes, this was a mistake or yes, this was an enemy. And we and like there's an example of a sniper on a roof, but there's civilians in the basement that you can't see. Uh, there are miscalculations. But somebody who takes that kernel of truth, like, yeah, they asked them to evacuate, but then they target the evacuation routes. That's not true. That's a lie. Uh, are there still strikes going on in southern Israel? Absolutely. Because there's still Hamas in southern Israel, because that's what Hamas does. Oh, you told my civilians to go there, so I'm going to intermix with them more so you can't strike me. Uh, it's, it's, it's lunacy to think otherwise. But hold Israel accountable. Yes, if you can show not, you know, and this is where, you know, now I, I'm really surprised at how many uh, war crimes experts there are in the world that I didn't know about or how many bomb <laughs> experts there are in the world. Holy crap, I've been on the receiving end of most of these bombs or RPGs and Apache strikes. It's just crazy that People like your know, Jackson Hinkle or others are, are wow, you, you, you achieved like 30 years of expertise really quickly uh, to where you can make a determination as soon as a strike happens. Like the hospital, I think we should talk about that. How a, you know, a Gaza or, oriented or a rocket from Gaza went up in the air, came down in a parking lot next to a hospital, but and then the entire world became an expert that one, that was a, a JDAM, a, a specific type of weapon. Uh, and th that where it came from without any evidence until the morning of, and it's a, it's literally a crater with some burned cars. No hospital was hit. No hundreds of civilians were killed. Uh, but that night, uh, I mean, the internet was full of these amazing experts who could interpret the sounds that were there. It was insane. Yeah. And, and, uh, immediately we knew the number of casualties as well, which, uh, oh. How difficult is happen. it to track? Yeah. yeah. How how difficult is it to track uh, casualty numbers? Uh, near and you know, impossible. Like uh, even that's why even the fourteen hundred civilians in Israel, where you can where people are weeks later still trying to collect body parts and piece together numbers uh, versus a building that it gets collapsed. But we know for a fact there are five hundred babies or you know, children uh, underneath that rubble. It's not the way war works. It, I really question all war uh, numbers, but I absolutely do not trust a single number coming from the terrorist organization Hamas. Uh, it's, it, 
it's just I mean, insanity. Even some Gaza Ministry of of Health that it gets reported as, and then UN even, and then later, what I noticed it, it when it again it morphed into the UN is reporting these numbers, not mentioning that the UN is also basing these numbers on what's being given to them by the Gaza Ministry of Health, aka Hamas, um, which is. You know, in the and people will say, well, past uh, numbers have been fairly accurate, consistent. Well, in past wars in that region, there were multiple other uh, entities present to tabulate, including Israel. So the numbers had to be, you know, somewhat accurate. In this war, we just have no idea. And by the way, that doesn't mean that they're not uh, striking civilians, including children, because Gaza has a lot of children. But as you said, the percent in most wars of casualties is 90% civilian, which I had no idea, by the way. And it was kind of a staggering and very sad realization. But it also makes it sort of consistent with other wars. Um, does it not? It does. Um, a little caveat there, as you mean, I don't, again, if you can, if we can show the IDF is, is striking civilians, then we should call it uh, yes. wrong in war crimes. They're striking military targets, which which civilians become a part of the, of the the casualty count. Although we have not seen a single, you know, this is the ideal that we can count Hamas military target casualties versus civilian casualties when Hamas doesn't identify itself in accordance with the law of war. So nobody, so even people that are really trying to report the numbers only report civilian casualties, and there's not a single person saying this is the number of Hamas military casualties because. It, that's impossible. Yes, the ninety percent of casualties in in war. The war the world is urbanizing, population growth. The fact that non state actors and weaker enemies purposely pull war into urban areas, um, where civilians, no matter what you do, although you must do everything you can to get civilians out of the common areas, do evacuations, do all the call the calls. Um, even then. Even in World War II, uh, there are battles where the Americans, Germans would surround cities and tell everybody to leave for, for weeks and for in four calls. And there's still thousands of civilians that won't leave uh, for, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and the civilian casualties are all, greater than any military number is unfortunate. But especially in just the last 20 years, because of the fact that these wars happening in the bad actors using the population and Hamas is like the stereotypical persons that do this where they don't care. And like, they quote, like they, they don't even hide it. They, they say it in their quotes. Like, why can't you let the civilians into your bunkers? Well, that's, that's not for civilians. This protection of civilians is somebody else's problem. That's the UN's problem. That's not my problem. These are for Hamas fighters. When they have 300 miles of tunnels that could protect tens of thousands of their people, the Palestinian people. And there's not a single case that I've seen where any civilian has been allowed to seek refuge in the underground, which is not typical in wars like we in Ukraine, where the underground is the refuge for the civilians. Uh, and even when you have military in tunnels, you can separate yourselves. Uh, it's just it's just crazy. No, it is. It is absolutely crazy. And that's why I absolutely see the Palestinian people, the ones who don't support Hamas, which of which there are definitely some. I don't know how many, but there are, definitely exist, um, you know, absolute victims in this situation. And, and you know, their lives are <laughs> completely meaningful. And it's very sad to see what's what's going on. And obviously with kids, they, you know, they really never really had a chance. But um but, you know, and, but I think one of the key sort of things that I have been observing, whether it's with Ukraine or Israel, is that that disinformation aspect does play such a tremendous role. And we see that also in the f manifesting and physical. So we talked about policy and things like that. But we also have mobs and crowds taking to the street based on false premises. So it's one thing to look listen to you, me, and completely disagree, have basis, rational basis for that disagreement, right? On some things anyways. Um, 
but not not on the part that condones uh, murder. But um, but you can disagree. You can criticize the Israeli military, maybe bring some factors. But a lot of people like I watched videos of people who didn't even know that October 7 happened, who are so uninformed and they're being informed by social media. So I see that and, and you're seeing that, you know, a rise in violence and radicalization coming from that. So. And it seems like an uphill battle because it's another battle, battlefield, right? Because we're trying to combat this disinformation and misinformation with facts. And I believe, you know, I'm a big, I believe in free speech. And, um, but I, but also I don't believe that people should go unaccountable for spreading lies and that lies should just proliferate and people can decide for themselves because obviously that's not what's happening. So how do we, what tactics could we use on the battleground of social media? Yeah, I mean, we need bigger influencers on on the on the the side of truth, which is really hard, right? That that's not even in media, right? Taking college classes about the media, that there's no such thing as uh, objective reporting. There's there's always uh, subjectiveness to it, but there are good people that really want to pr present the facts and to help in that fight. But I don't know the solution. I mean, it's actually a crisis in education where people um, don't know how to learn. They, they don't know how to make an opinion for themselves. And like you said, uh, yeah, I'm all, for, I'm all for freedom of speech and freedom of, of mobilization and, and, and marching and things like that. But, you know, hate speech is not protected. If the, the goal is to incite violence, then that's not protected and should be held accountable uh, strongly. Uh, I, I'm trying to do my my bet, but you know, it, it's unfortunate that the side of dif disinformation, the side of lies, it c grows faster because it is a matter of not only truth but the speed of of information. Right? That's I I, I it's unfortunate that the IDF was in a position, even of like the one thing that went a lot of these things to go viral is that they don't have the governments usually are slower to respond. And it's in and where an hour can be too late, like we said with the even the hospital strike. It doesn't matter now. I mean, I can tell you what happened all I want, but the in that one hour, millions of people were influenced to include the uninformed, and that's all they care about is that one event. And it took an hour to do the investigation to make sure that the the information that would be put out would be as factual and accurate as possible. I don't know really the, the solution. I mean, I think this is you are part of the solution. All of us are part of the solution, but to get some of the, the bigger influencers and unfortunately popular culture has an aspect of this too, right? Having the right voices saying, look, I, I, I don't condone, of course, the death of any civilians or targeting of any civilians and we hold them accountable, but let's not be crazy and have a constant voice to that. This is important, right? This is very important to all, to nations all around the world. I think it's very indicative of our general move from rationality to emotionality as, as something that runs things and skepticism and distrust. And so these uh, sort of influencers really play on that. But also the, the speed, I think, is, is a very big part of it. I think the technology is a big part of it. So the speed of, uh, you know, it, I think it's very responsible for media outlets, for example, to cover something before being able to verify something on that scale before being able to verify and then um with the social media aspects you know the IDF account is not going to be as as sexy and popular as uh, these uh, influencers who people feel like they build this like trust because they're saying what they want but also they're sowing distrust and and so there's a lot of psychological elements to it and then there's a mob mentality to it that we are also seeing online and so these become so difficult to counter and i think to you know, and I think perhaps the technological solutions like something like community notes, I do think is a great tool. It's getting better because it's starting to show up. If, if one, if a video got community noted, it's now showing up on multiple videos of this, which is something I've been advocating for. And I think what you touched on, uh, critical thinking in schools, I think we really, um, I think one way to sort of tackle this, though that's a much long, more long-term solution, is to have uh, these um, 
education uh, in the schools that is more critical, l learning how to do media, proper media analysis, statistics, things like that, I think would be, uh, and something that could be very uh, bipartisan as well, which I uh, which I think is is very important because it's a problem for everyone. But I really appreciate you ha having you on. I know your time is limited and you've got a lot uh, on your plate, but how can people find you? Sure. So, I, you know, I use X as one of my major platforms at Spencer Guard. I have a website called uh, johnspenceronline.com where you can see all my writings or the Modern War Institute as well. So I'm out there trying to, trying to do my research and, and bring the facts of what happens either in the past or in the present. I really appreciate that and all that you do. And and I think, uh, you know, if, if you want some military analysis, like it's <laughs> this is where the experts are kind of important, because I don't think you're going to get uh, through, you know, watch, reading Reddit threads and, uh, you know, watching YouTube videos, what you get fr from someone who's actually spent their life studying academically and having experience in the battlefield. And I think uh, people need to sort of recognize that real expertise is is still very, very, very important and shouldn't be dismissed because, you know, some people w didn't deliver as they should. But thank you again, and uh, yeah. I hope to talk to you again soon. Same.